Please come take your seats. Don't drink the whiskey. Listen, this is a fraternity party over here. I'm, I see you two back there. This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Sterling Cut Glass is the official whiskey and tasting glass supplier to distilleries across the country and is also the official glassware of Bourbon Pursuit. They are offering free etched samples to whiskey societies nationwide. Simply email spirits at sterlingcutglass.com, include your logo, and mention Bourbon Pursuit. Take a look at their online catalog with Glen Cairns, Copitas, Rock Glasses, Decanters, and more at burnpursuit.com and click on the banner for Sterling Cut Glass. Hey everyone, welcome back to another brand new episode of Burn Pursuit, and we've got a really good one lined up for you today, but let's hit a little bit of the news and a little bit of description about today as well. So everyone kind of remembers that Pappy heist, right? Well, some more news broke out, and that happened about a week and a half ago, but it didn't really make headlines, and that means our friends weren't blowing up our phones trying to tell us about this new Pappy heist, right? So Gilbert Toby Kurtzinger stole almost $100,000 worth of bourbon. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and is now being granted a shock probation after only serving 30 days. So either the judge maybe got a bottle out of it, or there's just crowded jails, but that's actually pretty crazy. Apparently they couldn't pin the pappy on them, but only the stolen barrels of wild turkey. And there's now articles stating that these barrels and the whiskeys will be returned to the distilleries. So perhaps there's some more fun named releases on the horizon. I know this is one episode that people have been waiting for. We've asked the Colvesine family from Willet to join the podcast plenty of times in the past, but they just didn't want to do it. However, our partnership with the Kentucky Derby Museum's Legend Series was able to make this happen. So thank you to the Derby Museum for letting us bring these great events to the masses. And remember, buy your tickets for the next Legend Series when they go on sale for the next season. It's really a world of difference to experience all this in person. But today, you get the chance to hear from the man that has made Willett Distil- Distillery what it is today. If it wasn't for Evan Colesveen's foresight to buy a bunch of aged stock from Heaven Hill and Bernheim years ago, then you wouldn't pe- see people going crazy for 14 to 27-year-old releases of Willett Family Estate. We also get a chance to hear from Britt Colesveen, who has been named the current president and chief whiskey officer. As a forewarning, the audio in this isn't what I would consider good or even great quality. We had issues with multiple camera crews on site. There were two microphones on both Evan and Fred. So the audio tends to fade in and fade out. So this is gonna be a fun one. Hopefully you get to enjoy this one as much as it was for all of us to be there in person to enjoy it as well. Now remember, if you do like this, support the show. We've got all kinds of great things such as uh, t-shirts, we got bottle totes, we've got barrel picks, we've got patches, we've got koozies, we've got stickers. So make sure you go and sign up on Patreon to see all the new updates that are coming through there. If you also want to follow us on social media, make sure you find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Bourbon Pursuit. Pretty easy to find us there to figure out what we're drinking uh, any day of the week. And make sure that you are subscribing to us if you're using iTunes, Stitcher, Podcast, or Last.fm. I don't know what it is, but make sure you're subscribing to the podcast And if you're watching this on video, make sure you're hitting the subscribe button on YouTube as well as on Facebook and you're liking us there. And if you want to get any new episodes, beam straight to your inbox and you want to know about it every Thursday morning at 7 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time, go to bourbonpursuit.com, scroll down, sign up for our mailing list, and you can get there with all the links to the show notes and everything like that. With that, enjoy this week's episode. This year's been about family. This is our fifth year of the Legend Series at the Kentucky Derby Museum. In years past, we did individuals talking to them about their careers and, and what they've accomplished. But bourbon is so much more than any one person. If you've ever been to a distillery, you've heard the stories of the beams, 
no doubt, the Willets. Today, we're here to honor who I think is one of the greatest palettes in bourbon history, and that's Evan Colesfame. And we are joined on stage by the president of the Willet Distillery, and uh, I have not done a thorough look into this, but I'm pretty sure you're the only president of a Kentucky, bur female president of a Kentucky bourbon distillery right now. So ladies and gentlemen, Trent Cassidy. Actually, I inherited it from my mother, so she was the first. Okay. I can't take all the credit. So you inherited it from mom. Yeah. I, I tried. I tried to get mom up on stage at last minute. Did you know about this? No. Did, can you imagine her telling me no? It was a pass me down. It was, yeah, she, she didn't want to come. It's, so, love to have you up here. <laughs> so, right here we have the Willa family. We have Drew, Martha, <laughs> Janelle. Don't forget Janelle. Janelle. Can you hear? Can you hear? Yeah. Janelle, hello. But the, the bourbon industry is about family and uh, the Willet Distillery and what this distillery has accomplished in the last uh, three or four decades is amazing to me as somebody who follows the studies, the history of bourbon and what the distillery has accomplished and what it has been through and what you have individually done is amazing. And we're here tonight to talk about you, Evan, Brett, your family. But I want you to know that this is the most people we've ever had here. This is a record for the Legends. Mm -hmm. they're, here, they're here for you. They're here, they're here to listen to a few stories. Mm -hmm. I want to start with, with your childhood. Where, where did you grow up? Norway. What part of Norway? <laughs> Uh, Hamar, which is part of the southern part of Norway. It's uh, about one third up from the very southern tip, but it, it's, if anybody knows where Oslo is, it's about 85 miles north of Oslo. Now I understand that when you... It's actually where they had the Winter Olympics in 1992. 94. 94. This is, this is why she is here. It was the last time I was, I was there, there, so I remember. <laughs> yeah. You were there. Yeah. That was actually the year that it was Tanya Harding and that whole fiasco. And we were on, what was it, Drew? Was it hard copy or something? Yeah. Yeah. Being interviewed about Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding and our American flag sweaters that mother dressed us in. That was. Yeah. <laughs> now, you, did you have any role in that at all? Did you... In the sweater or in the hard copy oh, interview? No. Tanya Harding. You know, oh, no, no. <laughs> no. Big conspiracy about that. Yeah. yeah, no. And I have not watched I, Tanya yet, so no. <laughs> But you were, you were an ice fisherman growing up, or like everybody ice fished. You... Well, that was sort of a sports or hobby thing. It's not something I did for a living, but... When you were a kid, you... Went to school and studied and skied. Did you... Did Made, you, you know, you played fish? in the snow. Did you ice fish as a kid? Yeah, fell through the ice a few times. You fell through the ice a few times? Yeah. What was that like? Cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was... Not fun. And you have you have a lot of brothers. Three brothers. Three brothers. Yeah. Were you the oldest? Second oldest. Second oldest. Yeah. What was what was uh, what did you all do? Did you go ice fishing and skiing? And was everybody drinking? I'm mean, just imagining everybody drinking aqua Yeah. Well. Ten years old at that time. Yeah, aqua is actually much more popular today than it was back then. Okay. It's, it's much better today than it was back then. It's. Uh, Back then, it wasn't all that good. What were you drinking back then? Not that you would ever... Uh, no, we never it. drank. Never? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, but they used to have a saying in Norway that everybody had a still in their basement except the sheriff. He had his neighbors doing his. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's not too different from Kentucky at one point. But that's fire. true. That's true. It was a natural assimilation here. Yeah. And that's, you moved here when you were 14? Yeah. What well, was, 50, I 50, just turned 15. You had just turned 15? Yeah. What yeah. was that like when you, when you moved here? 
Uh, well, it was well. I then moved to Kentucky, and I moved to Colorado then. Okay. So, and uh, I spent about ten or twelve years in Colorado, and then I came to Kentucky and met my wonderful wife, and got married. And she being from Kentucky, why? I didn't have any choice. I had to move to Kentucky. <laughs> now we're we're, go, we're definitely going to break get into that point. But one of the things that I learned about you uh, that I didn't know was that you joined the Merchant Marines. Right. That was before I came here. And you, I was, you, I was a lot younger then. There's apparently there's a story about you becoming a chef in the Marine, the Merchant Marines. Sort of, yeah. We didn't have official titles, but they did have a chef title, I guess. But, but he's asking you why you came into that role. Do you remember what you told me, Dad? Well, yes, but um, I'm not sure I should tell everything here. Listen, this is all, <laughs> this is all off the record. That's well, no, yes, no. I understand. That's why we're... You know. <laughs> They're drinking. No one's going to remember anything that we said. Oh, wait, it's no. good. Well, I, I mean, it wasn't anything, you know. The, the chef was basically, he, he liked to drink a whole lot. So, so he was a little too intoxicated to do yeah, chefing. Yeah, and I, so I did a lot of different. It was a merchant marine ship, so you know I had a lot of different jobs, working on deck and in the kitchen. But I spent most of the time actually ending up having to run the whole kitchen. So, yeah, it was a lot of work. But 45 people on board and five hot meals a day. Now, so you have a tattoo on your arm. Yeah. What, can, can we see that? Do you, is it, is it a visible, <laughs> no. visible show? What, no. Is there a story behind the tattoo? Pain. Pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was that a, was that a Merchant Marine story? Yeah. It's you know that was the cool thing to do was if you were in the Merchant but Marine. But did you actually get a tattoo of Hawaii in Hawaii? Yes. You did. Yeah. I just remember when I got my first tattoo, I got in a lot of trouble, and I reminded him that he had a tattoo on his arm. Mm -hmm. Didn't still well, go over very well. It that. still didn't go over very well. Yeah. Back then, that was, you know, 60, I don't know, some years ago, so 50 some years ago. People didn't do tattooing like to do today. Yeah, now it's, it was like, more it's of a an art. It was more of a sailor thing then. Yeah. yeah. It's a rite of passage if you're, uh, if you're at sea, you gotta yeah. have a tattoo. Well, that was what everybody said, so, you know, <laughs> if you didn't get a tattoo or a chicken, you couldn't go back on the ship. Really? They wouldn't let you back on if you didn't have a tattoo. And, you, and then you, you, you skied in college? Yeah. What was, what, what was your event? Uh, Nordic combined, ski jumping and uh, you know, cross country. I did some downhill too, but that was mainly it. Okay. So, so yeah, you're, uh, you grew up in Norway, right. you moved here uh, at, at a young age, yep. and you've had an amazing life, an amazing career. Yeah. And I didn't know this, and, but an amazing children, amazing children, amazing, an amazing wife, yeah. amazing wife. I'm a lucky guy, and a lot of friends. Yeah, a lot of good people. We have a very big family. Yeah. We're big very family. grateful for it. Well, and if you think about bourbon, it's one big family. You know? It is, and we yeah. do. You're, you're, you have a very large, uh, large family. Yeah. But one thing that surprised me when, when, uh, when Brett and I were talking was that you're not a U.S. citizen. No, I'm not. Is that by is that by choice? Is that something that you? Yeah. Just... Well, the only <clears throat> the only distinction is whether or not I can vote. I still get to pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know you're running the distillery, so you have to pay a lot of taxes. I do. We work for the federal government. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My uh, Martha's dad used to always remind us that we were glorified revenue collectors. Yeah. So. And it hasn't changed. So, but, was, there, was there ever a point um, in the last 25, 30 years where you're like, you know what, I'm going to become a citizen? Was there, have you ever, no. have you ever considered? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think there's been some elections we probably could have used your vote. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, I always said if my one vote would make a difference, I would consider it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it might have. <clears throat> it may have. Now, there, I do know there are some elected officials in the audience. And, uh, they got my vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Brad, I know you love your dad. I mean, you just you, you talk about him, even if it's just a text. You're just you exude a love that I think that every father would love to see in a child. Just 
One of the things you told me was like he's one of the most kindest people that you've ever met. <laughs> Can you give us a story about this kindness? See, that's kind of hard on the spot to pick one story. That's like when someone says, which one of these is your favorite bourbon? I'm like, well, it depends on my mood, so. Mm. Well, later I'm going to ask him who's his favorite kid, so. <laughs> I, don't, I try not to pick favorites. Yeah. <laughs> we can come back to that. I think right. I would like to think about that yeah. for a little bit, if you don't mind. So you got to come up with something good. Yeah, I do. <clears throat> Evan? Yeah. Since she, while she's thinking about bragging about you, I'm going to ask you to brag about her. She is now the president yes. of your distillery. Right. How proud are you? Very proud. But I'm proud of all of them. So. What, was, there, was there a moment in seeing, you know, because we all know Brett does a lot of the behind the scenes work, some of the things that are just kind of yeah. not glorified. Was there ever a moment where you saw her in action and you're like, wow, this is, she's got skills. Well, they, she does, and I'll tell you, they all have very excellent skills, you know that. Absolutely. So, so it's not about that, it's about, you know, trying to keep uh, an organization moving forward. And uh, What's she like, because when you, you, you all eventually have a meeting, you know, you're eventually sitting down and talking about, you know, the distillation and marketing or whatever. What's Britt like in a meeting? She's all business. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no mom, mom and dad there. It's it's all it's all business. All about the yeah. all about the product. Yeah. What about what about Drew? Pretty Drew much the same like, thing. It's all business. Drew is like you know. You know Drew. You know okay. both of them real well. Very well. You know Janelle. You know all of them. Very well. Yeah. A few weeks ago, Drew was in uh, Food and Wine magazine. He's been in Esquire. He's been in GQ. He's been he's been a lot yeah. of things. Yeah, he's a model. <laughs> he's a model. <laughs> he got all the photogenic genes. No, I wouldn't say that. You would. Mm, I would. By the way, look at these boots, everybody. Look, can you show everyone the boots? Yeah. Absolutely. That is some fashion. Yeah, high fashion. Now you, I've noticed this about you. You're always wearing boots. I am. Is there a story? Is there a story behind that? You just, you just well, there is a story behind these particular boots, but about the in general is if you've ever been out to our family's distillery, any of you, you know, at any given moment, you're walking through grass or mud, and we will probably never pave our rock road, mm -hmm. and climbing through warehouses and the bottling house and everything in between, and so you got to be able to get around. And if somebody gets out of line, you might need to. <laughs> Give them the boot. A little harder to. Yeah. yeah. These ones in particular, however, um, I was recently in uh, Washington, D.C. for an event, and I went over to Delaware for the day and spent some time with Mike Jajinski, who has Jeeps for Joy. And I was talking about how I really wanted a vintage leather jacket and this and that. And he said, oh, well, you know, my wife, Claire, and I, we have vintage clothing on the side. And I said, well, of course I did not know this. And so Mike and Claire actually gave me these boots. They had had these boots for a while. And they said, you know, nobody ever buys our boots. So we'll just give them to you because we know how much you like boots and we'll appreciate these. So Mike's a great guy. He is a great guy. Those are great boots. And they, you know, I... Um, uh, one of our friends was saying that your boots are kind of like my ascots. Like, you, know, it's like you're, you got your ascot, I got my boots. I think yeah. we even match. Yeah. yeah. That was not planned, but that's cool. Yeah. So you watched, you watched uh, your brother kind of come off the ranks. You're older. You're I am. I am. Old sister. You she's, watched, she's younger. She's younger. <laughs> I'm the oldest sibling, yeah. The, you, watch, you watch Drew kind of come off the ranks and see him you know, work with your dad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, the palate is not something that I don't know if it can be really passed down. You have one of the greatest palates of all time. And I feel like Drew is... Drew has a phenomenal up. palate. He, he has yes. a phenomenal yes, palate. Definitely. Well, was there something you did? Did you, did you train him? Did you... No, I think he's done it on his own. Yeah. We're watching you. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but he's he's has an excellent, excellent palate. When, when you're picking a barrel, because you you are one of the very first people to do small batching, right. to do a rifle. When you're picking 
one barrel and then you're tasting 15 or 20 others. What are you looking for to kind of create that small box, small batch composition? I always, I always look for something that I like. It's that. It's just that simple. It's something yeah. that you like, is it? Yeah. It either tastes right or it doesn't taste right. What's something that doesn't taste right for you? Oh well, I mean, sometimes it can be have a little harsh taste to it or bite or you know, and sometimes it can be just aging that's not just going right or not long enough or I mean it could be many different things. Was there ever a place like a particular special spot in the warehouse that you noticed that kind of drew those good flavors that you really like? Well I'm sure you've heard most people in the industry they always have stories about favorite places in certain warehouses and there's something to that, but I mean, you've been in our warehouses, and you know you can go on every, every. We have five floors in our warehouses; they're all the same, and uh, very small compared to, you know, other big distilleries. And one thing that works well for us is that all our warehouses sit on a high plateau, so we get excellent crosswinds. They're all there's wind in there all the time, so we get a lot of good breezes through there. But every floor in the warehouse has a different temperature and basically Humidity. its own microclimate. Mm -hmm. And then they're, you know, depending on what side the sun comes up and all of that. So, I mean, these are all things that you don't really think about as very much as a person on a regular basis, but, you know, it all makes a difference. So. He's not going to share the secret with you, Fred, if that's what you're asking. Well, but I'm giving you general information. It's hard to be specific about certain things yeah. like that. No, I, you know, your warehouse is, uh, you know, we were walking up. Well, you were there just a few days yeah, ago. Yeah, just a few days ago, I was there picking a barrel uh, for Urban and Beyond. And we were walking up the warehouses, the, the flights, and you could feel the, you could feel the temperature changing. Every yeah. In the summertime, it's much easier to feel it because you go up to the fifth floor, it can be 95 degrees or more, and you go to the bottom floor, it can be 15 degrees cooler. So that's a huge difference. And your warehouses, too, they have like, they kind of, they sit in a really nice spot, it gets yep. a good wind, and yep. um, it's just a really good location to get a lot of good sun it in It is, yeah. So there's, there's something to the magic in, in yep. your warehouses, yes. especially. It's what uh, Thompson always said that. You spent a lot of time with Thompson Willett, oh, yeah. your father-in-law. Yeah. What was something you learned from Thompson? Uh, a lot of wisdom. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever walk through a warehouse and did he show you a, a secret spot of his? Well, I don't know if it was a secret spot, but he'd call it a, maybe a nice, good spot or something, you know. But, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time together. Well, I think, you know, I think you'd be proud of, of the whiskey we have here today. I'd like to start with uh, the first one that we have here, which is the uh, frosted uh, yeast roll. And it's named after... Uh, so, Grandmother Virginia Willett, uh, one of the things in our family is we would always have bourbon yeast rolls at, whether it was Thanksgiving or Christmas, but there was a few times a year, Easter. So she would make the yeast rolls by hand. My Aunt Alice makes them to this day. And my job was, I mean, as young as I can remember, maybe five years old, was to make the icing for the yeast rolls. And the icing was simply um, powdered sugar and bourbon. And I would sit on the kitchen counter and I'd make the first bowl. And of course, it's a soupy consistency, so I would Taste eat the first well. bowl. And then I would, of course, make the second bowl for the rolls. And this barrel here, barrel number 704, it was distilled on May 17th of 2012, which is a sacred day for dad because May 17th is May Day in Norway, which is the equivalent of our 4th of July. It's also the first barrel pick that Drew and I have done together. And um, when nosing it, I kept saying this reminds me of childhood, just reminds me of grandmother's yeast rolls. And of course, um, Jaron Hyman, who's with the Jack Rose and the bourbon source, he was there with us that day. And he said, yeah, I totally get the frosting. And so that's kind of where it got coined with the frosted yeast rolls. So, but this is the first time we've ever bottled this particular mash bill. It's our high corn mash bill. And this is the first time we've ever bottled it before. 
So you're getting an opportunity to taste something yep. the first time. And the, the mash bill um, is 79 corn. I had 7% uh, rye, 14% uh, barley, and it's five years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where in the, what, what warehouse and what location would this have been? This was warehouse A. And Drew, is this floor th two? I couldn't remember if it was two or three, second floor. I'm going to find the Willet Sweet Spot here in a second, folks. <laughs> All my questions will be by design. I think you've been there enough to already know where they are, Fred. I don't know. We were in, what, the very back, and only I, I think only I could easily fit back there with the drill. And Drew is pretty comical. Um, Drew was like, where, you know, where's the hammer? It should be in the bag. And like, Drew, it's not in here. It's not in here. So Drew is plugging the barrel with his finger while we're trying to find the hammer. But Drew had over-prepared and had brought the hammer over by the barrel and didn't realize it. So it was behind me, yeah, yeah. Rookie yeah. mistake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Evan, I want to now talk about, you know, the time that you got in the business. This is, uh, how did a Norwegian get into the Kentucky bourbon business? Give us the very start. Like, how, how did you get into drinks business? I wasn't very smart. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, when, think, I think it's just the opposite. Yeah. Uh, when I came over here, I had always been interested in Norway. I had friends that, you know, we distilled things together and just experimented with mostly liqueurs uh, and uh, things like that. But uh, then when I came over here, went to school, went to college, and I always, uh, uh, in college, worked in the hotel trade and restaurant and bar and stuff like that while I was in college. So always involved in the consumer side of the industry. Uh, and uh, then uh, got together with my, you know, friend in Norway and said, you know, I'm going to be graduating pretty soon, so why don't we, you know, get some equipment made, send it over here. And actually, when I was getting out of college, my initial idea was to start a liqueur company, make liqueurs. I was a little bit ahead of the time. He's but, always been 40 years ahead of his time. Yeah. So, so we made some samples. And back then, Hublon was a big company <clears throat> in liqueurs, aero liqueurs and so forth. So I contacted them and, and sent them a sample and, you know, asked if they would be interested in, you know, some business relationship, whether it was uh, making it, distributing it, or whatever. And they said they were interested, but they wanted me to send them the formula. So I said, well, I don't think I can do that, <laughs> you know. So, because uh, then they wouldn't really need me much after that. But so, about, uh, I guess probably three weeks later, I got a call from an attorney in Denver. I was living in Colorado at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he said he had a colleague, a friend that was an attorney for Hubline. And, one, and so he had found out about it and wanted to know if I was interested in, you know, doing business with some people he knew. So I said, well, I'm, you know, just getting ready to get out of school, so I'm interested in listening to anybody, really. And so then uh, we kind of got together and uh, we're going to, you know, move forward with this, but it didn't seem like it was really going to go very far. So after a couple of years uh, working with them, I just started working on my own. And then one thing leading to another, uh, I eventually uh, moved down there to Kentucky and uh, then sort of shifted where it 
got into to where now it's bourbon and whiskey and other spirits and did make some really good liqueurs, but we never really sold them. So that's uh, still on the back burner. That's where it started, so and it's still on the back burner. There's still a chance we'll see those liqueurs, though. Yeah, maybe another 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when does limestone fit in the picture? That's who I was talking about. I wasn't going to, you know, bring bring them up by name or anything. But <clears throat> what, what did? Uh, when did you move here? I moved to uh, Kentucky in 1974. Okay. Yeah. And, and we got married in 1972. For, you know. So. How did you How did you all meet? Uh, we met at a place in Barston called Colonel Hawks. <laughs> Anybody heard of Colonel Hawks? No. And actually, Dad, didn't uh, didn't you think that Mom and JD were dating? That's my right. uncle and godfather. Yeah, her brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was here doing. Business. I mean, we're in Kentucky, but it wasn't <laughs> like that. <laughs> I was here doing business with her dad, and uh, because I lived in Denver at the time, we were basically a brokerage company and things like that, and did have some of our own brands, but you know, we represented other people too, so we had products made for us, and in this case, by the Willard Distilling Company. And so, uh, her brother, uh, who I became friends with before I had met her, uh, we were going out to dinner, and you know, uh, he was going to introduce some women, he said, you know, guys talk, you know. So, she came in, we were eating dinner, so she came in and started hugging J.D. and I looked and I said, J.D., what are, you know, I thought you were going to introduce somebody to me. And he said, well, this is my sister, he said. And I said, yeah, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, if that's really her sister, then I guess she could be my date. <laughs> so, is that how it happened? Yes, <laughs> okay. Now this, this and, she, and, and she didn't think I was really worth dating, so. Really? <laughs> well, there, there, there's a, I received a quote that she, uh, she thought you were, quote, the most arrogant son of a bitch she yeah. ever met. There you go. What I just say, I was just being politically correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, you know, I was young then. I mellowed out. Now. You mellowed out a little bit. She has to. <laughs> How'd you win her over? Oh, it took several days. <laughs> yeah. but, several but, cocktails. But uh, we, I guess we got married, what, six months after we met. Wow. So I'm a fast worker. <laughs> and you, you would end up having an amazing relationship with her dad, yes. Thompson. Yes. Thompson uh, you know, I remember, you know, in the seventies, reading through, um, you know, newspapers article, newspaper articles at the time talking about the bourbon industry, and how he was uh, complaining that all the big brands were bailing out on bourbon, yeah. and that they were moving into vodka and like whiskey, yeah. and like they're not getting tequilas, and they just didn't care about bourbon anymore. What, what was that time like? And right now, we. I mean, we're packing, um, you know, uh, hotel rooms and you know, even uh, having major concerts attached to bourbon. Yeah. What in the world was it like to, at a time? We can't imagine, right? It's hard for me to fathom bourbon not being popular. But what was it like in the 70s when it just started going down? Well, it was pretty tough. There are people here in the room that can tell you the same thing that are in the business. It was the bourbon industry became very, very flat, and uh, they, they, that's when they, uh, they were trying to make changes. They came out with Frost 880 and light whiskeys, lower the proof, you know, because bourbon uh, traditionally up to then had really never been below 86 proof. And they were going to lower it to 80 proof, and they said, nobody's going to buy that. And so they came up with all these light whiskeys and everything, and most of that failed. 
I think QT is one of the few that remains on the market today that came out back then. And, uh, but, you know, people change, habits change, and products change. And you have to change with the times and yeah. sort of try to keep up with what's going on, or otherwise you're going to be left behind. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like there wasn't much bourbon can do to really win over the consumer back then. No. They no. were just done. Yeah, it was very difficult. And I was actually, uh, that was in the, I remember it really well because I was running a bar and restaurant in, when I went to college back then in the 60s. And uh, it was, everybody was talking about it, you know. So, but you see what's happening today, I mean, now, last number of years, last decade or so, bourbon, you got, you know, says bourbon and something, but I mean, it's bourbon and cherry, cherry bourbon, blueberry bourbon, melon bourbon, you know, I mean, and then the claim is that it expands the category. Well, if you're including all those, yes, but, but somehow bourbon has managed to come out on top as an individual product. Now, I, I've always believed that bourbon is really the uh, finest, most expensive whiskey, uh, you know, that there is. Because you just look at the cost involved in making bourbon compared to other whiskeys, even brandies, cognacs, anything. You know, bourbon, you know, because of the regulations, you know, we can, we, we can only use the barrel one time, and we sell it to the Scotch people or Canadians or nowadays everybody. They can use it forever. So their cost per gallon on the barrel, as, you know, compared to bourbon, is like nothing. And yet all those decades and decades, they would be getting higher dollars for their products than bourbon ever could. But that's all changed. And you, you, you saw it when bourbon was down, you saw it always climb up. What, yeah. Was there ever a moment where you were like, all right, bourbon's back? Yeah, I remember that well too. You, it's, Japan is when, when I started in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. That's where that just went from flat to like that. And it was just one place, but uh, I remember it real well. And, and you, you actually study Japanese, so you can yeah. connect yeah. With the Japanese market, do you, do you, are you still fluent? Oh, I was never fluent. <laughs> <laughs> I could just say a few words to be polite, but yeah. that's enough for them to appreciate it. Yeah. They really, you know that, they appreciate anything like that, even if it's just a few words. They do love their <clears throat> bourbon there. Oh, yeah. They love, they love our bourbon, Fred. They love our bourbon. Early 80s, um, there was just a little bit of a... Uh, indication that you know bourbon was becoming uh, popular in Japan, and uh, then because uh, that was a pretty much a non-existent market for bourbon up till then, they, they had some bottles there because uh, the uh, Jim Beam and Brown Foreman had their Jack Daniels, and uh, then. Uh, a couple of other uh, companies had their product in wide distribution around the world where it was available in certain places, but there weren't any sales to speak of. And so it wasn't that it was unheard of in those markets, it's just that there was no consumer interest. Right. But all of a sudden, uh, the Japanese, uh, I guess the emperor maybe had announced that bourbon was good, I don't know. Yeah, but, someone did, right? Yeah, like right. Out of nowhere. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it, it didn't take very long. It was like an eruption. And the market in Japan went from basically nothing to hundreds of thousands of cases in no time flat. And, and then uh, what started happening after that was a ripple effect where it would you know, uh, go to adjoining uh, islands, adjoining countries, and that's still going on today. Absolutely. And okay. that's how it's spreading. 
And you had, uh, did you have bourbons that you specifically targeted for? <laughs> yeah, actually, it was, uh, and when we, you know, noticed this, we obviously tried to take advantage of marketing and contacting companies, but the Japanese uh, are a whole lot different to do business with than Americans or other people. Uh, and uh, they're only back then and even now, they're big, what they call uh, Geisha or Keisa companies. Uh, there is a handful of those old established companies and they pretty much back then ruled everything. But today that's also changed a whole lot. So now uh, there are lots and lots of uh, companies that are importers and wholesalers there and uh, new, new upstart companies in the last 20, 30 years. Whereas in the old days, there were only all established companies and that was it. When did you come out with the small batch, your small batch series? Uh, in the 80s. This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Sterling Cut Glass is the official whiskey and tasting glass supplier to distilleries across the country and is also the official glassware of Bourbon Pursuit. Sterling has contracted with the finest European crystal factories to bring the best quality glassware into their Kentucky warehouse and production facility. If you've been following us on social media, you'll see how their deep etched glassware is truly the best in the industry. I know because I searched up and down the internet to find out who was the best. Come to find out, Sterling Cut Glass supplies almost all the distilleries on the Bourbon Trail, and they're also the official glassware of the PGA Tournament and the Kentucky Derby. Make your logo shine on Capita nosing glasses, Glen Cairns, Neat Tasters, Rocks, Tumblers, and more. They're offering free etched samples to whiskey societies nationwide. Simply email spirits at sterlingcutglass.com, include your logo, and mention Bourbon Pursuit. Take a look at their online catalog by going to bourbonpursuit.com and clicking on the banner for Sterling Cut Glass. When did you come out with the small batch, your small batch series? Uh, in the 80s. Was it 80, 85? 86? It was somewhere in the mid 80s, I can't remember. I'd say it was closer to 1990. It was, yeah, it was, it was probably late 80s. Yeah, then. late 80s. Yeah, okay. yeah. And that was one of the very first small batch uh, yeah. collections that were out there. When you yeah. were when you were devising that, what was uh, what were you? How many has it changed much? Is it... well, the interesting thing was, and we actually started selling our small batch products overseas because we showed it to distributors here in this country, and uh, then they said, "Well, nobody here is going to buy that. It's you know too expensive." Our customers, you know, they don't buy anything over $8 or whatever, you know, back then, $10. And uh, so our overseas customers, which at that time, we had already established a good overseas business. So we were actually doing more business overseas than we were in this country. Wow. And the funny thing that happened to us was that that's what our overseas customers wanted those kind of products and that's what we had to offer and uh, then later uh, Jim Beam who you know as you know is now owned by the Japanese uh, but back then when they came up with their small batch series four products just like ours uh, they really are the ones that plow the fields in this country to allow for that to become a category. So, you know, everybody in this business should recognize that. Absolutely. I think you're aware of it. Yeah, so. well, I think it's also, um, I, I would like to note that, you know, you just, you were giving props to a competitor yeah. in some yeah. respects there. It's well, we don't think of anybody as competitors, really. Yeah. But. But, you know, because, you know, this whole industry is made up of families and friends. It's a yeah. small business. Even though it's a huge business, it's a small business. But, uh, so what happened then was that people, uh, distributors, 
in this country that had traveled overseas and seen our products in famous like uh, you know Harrods or famous stores in London, Paris, Japan, all over the place, started contacting us when they found out where the products were coming for, from, and asking if they could represent our products in this country. Yeah, speaking of Harrods, if so, I may interrupt, this is what Drew and our childhood was like. So most kids, you know, and, and Mom and Alice did take us to Disney World, so I'll thank you for that. But most of our travels were not domestic, they were international, and they were going to the places like Harrods to check out the floor displays of our products. So our vacations our whole life were going around to all these various countries, which was, I mean, very interesting. It was an amazing childhood, but it would be to look at the floor displays of dad's products. And so to this day, it's probably why when I walk into a liquor store, it's an adult toy store for me, because I, it's just, you know, it's just the over, yeah. Oh, yeah. But one of the places that um, I know was difficult to get to back then was Russia. Did you ever, did you ever travel to Russia in the yes. 80s and 90s? Uh, yes, uh, I actually went to Russia and uh, right after the Olympics in Norway because I figured I was pretty close by. So, and uh, had a little trouble on their airplanes. So they didn't have the right parts, so I was delayed a little bit, but got there. And uh, then uh, we've done some business there, but it's uh, even to this day, uh, it's a very difficult place to do business because monetary issues and things like that. Like, is it, is it just like a, a trust issue with like distributors in Russia? Or? Yeah, and there's some very major companies there now mm -hmm. that have, you know, the wherewithal to do things. But uh, as a rule, we try to work with more medium-sized and smaller-sized companies because to us, uh, our philosophy is that, uh, you know, like a huge company uh, that has pretty much anything they want to have. In a lot of cases, yeah, they might like our products and have them. In some cases, just because they'd want somebody else to have them. And that's not a good reason to do business with them. And uh, so we feel more comfortable doing business with people where our products mean something to them. Right. And it's important to them. That's a much better working relationship. I think like tonight, I feel like this is the, the audience and the, the Derby Museum, the Willett brand means a lot to everybody here and, and to the museum. Yeah. And I think, you know, the way you have grown that has been, has been really magnificent. Britt, what was, what was it like as a kid, um, you know, watching your dad, you know, go, you know, live out of a suitcase in some respects and go to a liquor store, liquor store, I mean, and live it, live it around whiskey all the time. What, what was that like? Well, you know, our mom and dad made a tremendous amount of sacrifices so that we could be where we are today. And, um, you know, it was a magical childhood. It's something that um, some probably wouldn't believe. For example, I don't know how many kids were putting mealworms in minis of tequila bottles when they were however old Drew and I were, and yeah. <laughs> those mealworms are three cents a piece, don't, don't drop, drop those. Don't drop them. Don't drop them. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like whenever I walk into work every day, so, you know, Drew's our master distiller, and then my sister-in-law Janelle does an amazing job running our visitor center, and, um, but when I walk into the bottling house to this day, when I open the door and I smell, I literally, I just, I, that's the smell of my childhood. There's just the smell in the bottling house. People smell bourbon. I don't smell bourbon. It's just this smell that you can't even describe. And it just, it's my childhood. And, um, you know, of course, we never had any shortage of alcohol um, in our homes growing up. And I will say that, you know, I didn't really realize what I realized today that when in high school and I would steal bottles. Sorry, Dad. And yeah. we, knew, would, we knew about it. Yeah, I know you did. But you know, when I would sneak out with these bottles, I mean, I didn't know I was probably drinking like a 25 year old cast strength whiskey. Oh. <laughs> I just knew it was bourbon in a bottle and it didn't have a label on it. Nobody was gonna notice that it was missing from the cabinet. Yeah. So um, there's just a lot of things that, you know, 
growing up that you don't even think about it because it's just a part of your life. But one thing that was also unusual for us is that, you know, mom, of course, she worked too. She was, before she got into this, she was the best social worker in the state of Kentucky. Way to go, mom. Very, very, very challenging job to have. And, you know, she would have dinner ready every night and we would probably eat dinner at eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night when most kids were going to bed because that's what time dad got home from work. And, you know, to this day, dad works seven days a week. And um, so everybody's just made a lot of sacrifices for us to where we are, to where we are today. But he also always made time for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, um, when we were very little, uh, I think I might have been five, maybe Drew was three, I don't remember. But we took, Dad took us on a plane ride from Louisville to Cincinnati, which is, I don't know what, an hour and 10 minute car ride, just for the sake of us having our first airplane ride. I mean, that's just, I mean, who does that, you know? Now, our parents did not have good sense when they thought that Drew and I were old enough to go to Norway on our own. I was, I think, six and Drew was four. And then, you know, you just had a stewardess that accompanied you the whole way, and you got little badges and coloring books and all these fun things. And so anyway, we were going to fly over to Norway to spend the summer there with Dad's family. We made it as far as Newark, and we had a delay of five hours, and we spent all of our money in the Newark airport. We bought watches, we bought pizza, <laughs> we were just, you know, we ran out of money before we even left Newark. So long story short, you probably don't want to let Drew and I travel alone together these days with a yeah, unlimited I, bank account, but. Yeah, it'd be real bad today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially if the airport's carrying boots, right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but you know, it was great. And you know, a lot of times on Christmas day, my mom and her sister, we would drive down to um, Florida and we would have, um, you know, you'd have Christmas at the beginning of your day and then you were at Disney World a few days thereafter. We did that for many, many years. And of course, dad flew us all over the world. I mean, we weren't vacationing just in Florida. We were going to Norway to visit our family in Germany and Paris and London. And you know, my daughter Scout's complaining because she's seven and she's never been to Paris. <laughs> and, she's seven. But you know, we, had a, we did have definitely a storied childhood. Yeah. So let us go to the next uh, bourbon on your, on your uh, map there. This is the weeded bourbon, 65% corn, 20% weed, 15% Barley, 115 uh, barrel entry proof, five years old. And this is, this is all whiskey you distilled, you and your son distilled. This is, I think, isn't this, uh, this your formula, Drew? Drew, I believe this is Drew's creation right here. This is Drew's? Yes. That's Drew's formula. And I, I it's, it's probably probably our best whiskey, I think. I think. So. This is delicious. Now, when when you're when you're tasting his distillate or something he's bringing to you, do you ever say, "No, not good enough. Bring bring me something back." Not if it's our whiskey. Well, when he brought me that and I tasted that, and I told him we need to double the production. <laughs> he did. That, that's good uh, That's good advice. And I believe I tasted some barrel samples of this the other day. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. When you're, what do you, uh, what's a note that jumps out on this for both of you? What's a note? To me, that it's just, it's, it's just both gentle and elegant. It's, it's very soft and mellow. It's just really excellent and has full body. Very nice. Yeah. Well, I want to kind of go to the time when you took over Willow, when you when you acquired the, the company. Yeah. What what was that uh, what was that like? What was your what was your thought process going into you know taking over what was your father in law's business? Well, uh, you may or may not know this story, but. They had actually sold the distillery before I took it over, and so it was a complicated situation. So we basically had to rebuild everything from scratch, and we tore the distillery down to the ground, rebuilt everything. So, wow. Yeah. When when you were coming back in the in the business, a big part of your business was 
was doing private, doing, uh, doing bottles for other people. Right, because we had to have income to stay in business, so that's what you had to do. What were some, that you can tell us, like I'm yeah. sure you had to sign all kinds of non-disclosure agreements, but what were some of the, some of the bottles that people here might recognize? Actually, for Fred, we never did. You never signed any? No, in we're not our, big on signing contracts. Oh, that's great. Working. When I came in this business, I was very fortunate. That's great. I was, you know, in the old days, they used to have people, this business was always built on your word and your handshake. Yeah. And if that wasn't any good, you, you weren't going to be in business. Who were some of the people that kind of you worked with? So whenever we worked with people, we just have an understanding, verbal agreement, and a handshake. And if that isn't good enough, you're not going to get it better by signing something. And that's how we've always operated. And we never had problems with anybody. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now everybody wants to give you like five agreements on something. Yeah. When you were when you were uh, starting out and you were, had to acquire you had to acquire bourbon from other distilleries, right. what were what were you uh, looking for, you know, during that time frame of you know what kind of whiskey were you looking for? Mostly, uh, obviously, good quality whiskey. Obviously, needless to say, but uh, almost all the whiskey that we acquire from other distilleries or old whiskey, because at the time, they didn't market it, they didn't know what to do with it, and uh, we uh, actually would buy just old whiskey, because that's what our customers wanted, because we had built a tremendous business overseas for those kind of products. And it was many years before everybody else started understanding that. and. At one point, uh, we're such a tiny company in this industry, but uh, when rye became popular again in the beginning of the 90s, uh, everybody thinks it was much later, but it was in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, just when I became aware of that, I bought up all the old rye whiskey I could find, and we actually ended up having more old rye whiskey than all the other distilleries in the country. Wow. Yeah. Were you getting some of that, was that some of them like old Pennsylvania distilleries? I Maybe. can't tell you where we got it, Fred, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really good whiskey. Those handshakes, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, handshakes. yes. What, uh, was and there and it wasn't very long afterwards, everybody hated us. Yeah. <laughs> Because you had all that stock, right? Was there a was there an age limit on uh, that you would look like you, like you wouldn't go for anything under eight years old or? Well, most of the old stocks that we bought would run from. We did buy some younger, just for certain markets, but okay. uh, and then we would blend it ourselves, you know. But uh, the uh, most of the older whiskeys we bought would typically be, uh, you know, ten to 20 and up to 25 year old whiskeys. Wow. Today you can't buy those. No, no you can't buy them. I don't, I don't care how much money you have, yeah. you can't buy them. So some of those, uh, some of those batches, probably up until about 2008, would they have include uh, uh, whiskey from several different distilleries? Many different distilleries, yeah. Because none of them wanted any old, see, Years ago in this industry, uh, the distilleries, when they were selling four-year-old whiskey, most of the time it wasn't four-year-old whiskey. It'd be six, seven, or eight, even older whiskey, because they would get rid of their old whiskey first, because they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't market it as an aged premium product. You know, and so that's just something that's become obvious to them in the last dozen years. See, I'm finding this fascinating because, you know, right now we're starting to see people release ridiculous ages, like 36-year-old bourbon, 45-year-old yeah. bourbon. Yeah. You know, they're releasing things like that. Right. Like it's, it's like now we're going to the other end of the spectrum, but yeah. there is a sweet spot for those, for those, old bur those older bourbons. For you, right. like what's a, good, what's a good range for, for an aged bourbon like that? 
A good ranch, you mean quality-wise? Yes, absolutely. Well, that, that becomes, I mean, that's a big floating bubble because uh, you can have a whiskey that's eight years old that's far better than one that's twice that age and vice versa. It all depends on the whiskey, the mash bill, the history of where that barrel has been, everything. I mean, it, there's no, it is so individual. There's, there's no really way to, that's when you really have to taste and sample things. And that- And Brent, you've done plenty of that. And you, and Dad's gonna say, Britt, that's where your father has been so special, mm -hmm. is that he has tasted those things and brought it to us, whereas a lot of other distillers would have never have brought a 15-year-old Noah's milk. Well, no, as Dad said, I mean, you know, yeah. people outside of this country were very interested in aged premium products like that and not necessarily here. And one of the things that has always been unique to our business is that we have specialized in very rare small batch and single barrel whiskeys and especially bottled at cast strength. That's kind of one of our signatures because we want you to enjoy raw whiskey straight out of the barrel the way that we think it should be enjoyed. You can add water as you would like to dilute it down to whatever your preference is, but we'd like to share it with you just straight out of the barrel, just that raw whiskey. And you know, to this day, because our operations are such this small scale that they are, you know, when we say small batch, although it's one of the few things in our industry that's completely unregulated, a small batch to us is a maximum of you know, 20 to 25 barrels at a time, and that's in everything that we do. That's the maximum amount of barrels that we use at a time. So it's, it is a lot of work and time in selecting those exclusive honey barrels that go into each small batch. Otherwise, it's just a single barrel. So we still, to this day, very much specialize in just the rare, um, aged cast strength whiskeys. That's true, but the family, you all have the gift of being able to know when, when a bourbon's ready to bottle. Or as in the case with our next tasting, the rye. This is, a, this is very exciting for me. I remember first tasting this rye. Drew walked me through the warehouse. He put the drill in. He actually, unlike with the, mm. the one you described, the the whiskey didn't go everywhere, everywhere. He plugged it up pretty easily. But I remember tasting that rye. I think it was two or three years old at the time. And I just knew it was going to be special. It's, yeah, you know, we actually, when we started releasing our rye distillate, we originally re released it at 27 months, which you can get away with with a rye, not with the bourbon. Right. Um, but we are getting ready to release our four-year out in the market this year. Um, so this is a rare treat for everybody. Yeah. So this is a six-year-old rye from, uh, this would have been one of the very first distillates coming off the still there when you all started back up in 2012. Mm -hmm. The mash bill is 51% rye, 34% corn, and 15% barley. The barrel entry proof is 125. Uh, that is no longer the case. You all are 110 Well, now. the bourbon with the exception of the weeded. The bourbon goes in at 125, the weeded goes in at 115, and the rye goes in at 110. Yeah, so the rye is at, it goes in at 110 now. That knows. Yeah. I think the rye is just phenomenal, but I'm a rye girl. Yeah. We get, we get a, lot of, well, a lot of praise on our rye whiskey. Every time we taste, they want to applaud. Yeah. That's a good thing, right? You've earned it. You know, it occurs to me that, you know, this is tasting this, this product. I wonder if you could, going back, dipping back into the, the memory banks for a moment, where would this, where would what you have, what we have tasted tonight rank in the great barrels coming out of Willet from the 80s and 90s and oh, Jesus. early 2000s? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think we, we tried to, I mean, the, the older whiskeys that we used to acquire, you know, years back were heavier bodied whiskeys. But the consumers today, for the most part, 
drink lighter body whiskeys, but we try to still maintain as much, you know, body in our whiskey as possible, because personally I like a heavier body whiskey. And well, you talk about that all the time, Fred, about people comparing their whiskey in the 70s and then today you talk about that all of the time and yeah. what's changed and yeah. and uh, the only reason that these aren't as heavy body right now as the ones the older stocks that we bought you know acquired years ago is that these are only half the age but they will they get feel. they will they will they'll gain a lot more body they feel alive on the palate. Yes, they have, they have a very clean, fresh taste. They're, yeah. you know, if, if this is where we're at in five, six years, you know, count me by getting in line at 12 years. Yeah. You know, 10 years, eight. Won't be long. Yeah, I know. It'll be here before we know it. Yep. Now, we, we take a look at, we, we talked about the 80s and a little bit of the 90s. Will it starts really becoming popular in the 2000s, and I don't mean just a little popular, I mean it's like a cult following. Right. I mean now you have umpteen amount of uh, Facebook pages about stalking. Fred, we're not on, we are not on social media. You're not on Facebook? I don't, I've never been there. You're he's not? Ne he's never been I've there. I've never, never, never been, been there. Facebook or in, Insta chat? I've heard about it. <laughs> You're not missing anything, yeah. but I will tell you that there's a lot of fan pages out there for what you have done. Yeah. And I, did you ever allow yourself to enjoy any of that fandom that was kind of rising in the I've 2000s? I've never, never been involved in any of it. You just like making whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get up and go to work and go home and eat and go to bed. <laughs> I'm a boring guy. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, it's... No, that's definitely not true. But Britt says you're the world's most interesting man. Dad, oh, wow, that so guy, that guy was in a beer commercial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Dad, well, you just be sitting there. He does it to every single one of us, and he'll say, you know, I don't even care what you're talking about. Well, you know, back when I was on the Olympic ski jumping teams, what? I wasn't, well, you know, I wasn't on the Olympic ski jumping Well, season. okay, that's a bit exaggerated, but my point is you'll say, you know, when I was a bartender, this, that, well, I didn't know you were a bartender. It's just fill in the blank. It doesn't matter. It says it to mom every day. She's like, I didn't know that about you. You've been married how many years now? 45 years. Yeah. Well, I can't tell it all to you at one time. <laughs> but the, the, the amount of interest in, in Willet and what you have done, um, I can only think of, of, of one other brand that had the, the equivalent of that in, in, these, in the past 25 years, that would be Pappy Van Winkle. But you, you're right there neck and neck with, with, uh, with that same kind of enthusiasm. And through the whole time, you've remained family owned. Right. How, how many times have you been asked from somebody, like, can we own a share? Can we buy you? Can we, how often Tell, tell them about the, the best deal many, you got, Dad, many. from the Japanese. Yeah. Well, that's a long time ago, actually. That was in the 80s. We, we did a lot of business in Japan in the 80s and 90s. In fact, we couldn't, we couldn't print enough labels fast enough. And they would come, knock on our door. I mean, we had probably 20 different importers in Japan. And uh, we couldn't keep up with it. But uh, one day, one of the ones we did a lot of business with, uh, came and uh, with three or four of their, they're all IBM pinstripe suit guys, you know. So when they come to us, of course, you've been there. So we're not like, uh, well, we're not Brown Foreman, you know. So uh, we usually get them to taste something and then we get their tie off and, you know, we get them to become human beings. And so, so the big guy, says to me, uh, we're sitting there talking about business, and he says, uh, we have very good news for you. And I said, oh, that's good. And he says, we'd like to make you offer to buy you out. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And uh, so I said, uh, I don't know, I'd have to give that some thought. And he says, 
It's a very good offer, and we're ready to be, do business, he says. And I said, well, I just don't know, you know, what I would do if I sold to you people. I'm not ready to retire yet. So he says, well, we want you to stay here and run it. And I looked at him and I said, well, I'm doing that now without you. <laughs> and he looked at me. And he looked at me and he just didn't understand. And I explained to him, he says, and he says, but you'd have all this money. And I said, yeah, but you don't understand. You want me to still live here in Barstow and run it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we didn't make a deal. Yeah. <laughs> But other people have come to you and yeah, man, to, many times. Yeah. Does it get it? it has it? Have you said no so many times they eventually stop calling? Some of them stop calling, but we still get calls. Yeah. Some of them just go by others. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's easier. Yeah. <laughs> Path of least resistance. There have been a lot of uh, distilleries purchased, small yes. and large, yeah. in the last. Uh, five Some years. for completely ridiculous sums. Some completely ridiculous. No, he's saying for ridiculous sums. Yeah, we're like yeah. oh yeah, so like yeah. uh, like High West, which sold yeah. for like 160 million yeah. to Constellation, that was public. You know, so yeah. there's been there have been a lot of those. Yeah, but uh, you know now now Brett, she's the president. She, yeah. She's got to hold the fence up now. Yeah. Do you have any advice for her for like how to say no to people trying to buy the company? I've oh, had oh, first-hand oh, experience on several of those occasions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, she probably wouldn't even talk to them. I, I, at least, I'm, you know, nice enough to talk to them. <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it's effective if you don't talk to them. You know, you don't know, ever get the offer. So. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a non-responder. That's not something I'm known for. But yeah. I will say that, you know, his dad always says that family business is not for everybody, and it's the toughest business to be in. And yeah. that's true. And, you know, we're just very fortunate that it works so well with our family. And I love that, you know, I can pretty much say anything, and I don't think I'm going to get fired. And, you know... We're not worried about hurting each other's feelings. It's just a very transparent operation and it works really well for us. So we don't have any plans of changing that. You know, we have the 80th anniversary coming around here. Yes, and I would so. like to uh, personally thank, we would like to personally thank our friends from Jack Crows for donating this yes. to, for us. Where are they? Evening. See Jared in the back. Stand up. Jared, where are you, Bill? Good friends of mine. Bill just donated it because he wants everybody to find his face on the bottle. <laughs> Bill, Bill is the, is one of the least vain people I know, so yeah. you know I, I know he probably had to twist his arm for that. Mm -hmm. Bill's 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 been a big supporter of uh, of Willett. Yes, he has. I, re I remember when uh, Jack Rose in Washington D.C., which is I believe the the world's best whiskey bar, and I do I do believe that. You know, it's filled with mostly Willet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, like, you, you did used to go in there, and there'd be like three or four shelves of Willet. But as the popularity has hit, it's like those shelves get a little yeah. smaller every, yeah. every day, I feel like. Yeah. yeah. I think they've got some senators drinking a little bit of Willet back then. Yeah. There. Yeah, we know there's some of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you definitely know you got some senators drinking the product. Yeah. Well, hopefully, it helps them uh, make better votes. Well, that, so that would be good. So tell us about the, the, the 80th anniversary is, um, is a four-year-old. It's 72% corn. Um, bottled and bond. 13% rye, 15% barley. Bottled and bond. That's the original uh, Willet mash bill. And uh, that's really, really what I would <laughs> call uh, an excellent traditional Kentucky bourbon whiskey. Mm -hmm. It's really what Kentucky is all about. It knows it's like it's much older than four year old. That's the thing about this yeah. one. It's like it Yeah, you know, we talk about it. And that. and Fred, when the Willet Distilling Company years ago, you know, old Bardstown was one of their big brands. That's right. And at one time 
Old Barstown was the second biggest selling brand in the state of Kentucky. And the biggest seller they had was that mash bill right there at a hundred proof ball in bond. Mm. Got some complexity to it. It's really, it's, it's really good whiskey. I love this whiskey. Yeah. It's one of those where you see it, you see it pop up on the secondary market every now and then, and it sells for like four times the amount that you would have initially charged for. Yeah. And that's going a little bit to that, to that popularity. Is it, is it difficult being so loved? But, you know, in the whiskey community, because you don't see many bad things, uh, you know, written or said about, about your whiskey. Does that? Well, they probably have plenty to say after tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those, like, it's like, you know, for a long time, like, the Yankees won all the championships. And, and if, if you listen to the, the interviews, they would always say that it was harder being on top. It was easier coming out from the underdog. Is yeah. it hard? If you're on top, you can't really go higher than on top. And you've, you've seen, you all have seen to hit with your whiskey releases uh, at the top like every year. And it's like, that's hard to do. We're just getting started. Yeah, you're but, but you're right, it's very hard to do and keep doing. That's the hard part is to keep doing it. What, is that the biggest challenge? It's just... It's a, it's a big challenge. Yeah. We have lots of other challenges too. Well, Brett, earlier I, I asked you to tell me the story about, about your dad. It's been some time. Have, have, have you had a chance to think of one? We can go to the audience for questions and we can follow up again if you like. Yeah, well, he's really pressing on that story, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> he, he must we'll be waiting on some dirt to come out here. I know, and I'm trying to really behave myself, Dad. So don't drink, you know. don't drink anymore. How many mash bills do you have, and how many strains? I'll of let yeast? you answer about the yeast. Um, okay. Well, actually, I will. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we do about four different mash bills on bourbons and two different mash bills on rye these days, and. I like for Drew to answer your question on the yeast because that's more in his expertise. But I don't tell him all the secrets. We use one yeast. Yeah. So yeah. I, on the mash bills, four bourbons and two ryes, but we use one yeast. Yeah. That's right. I do know we use one yeast, but that's enough details on that, I guess. <laughs> How well, many jobs did you do before the kids arrived? Oh, boy. I had to do all of them. Yeah. I don't know how many that was. <laughs> <laughs> Any future consideration on mash bills that he's working on? Uh, we always have thoughts about those kind of things, but that's sort of long-term things because it's, it gets involved very quickly when you start. I think I know what he was wanting to know is if okay. you're experimenting with any flavored whiskeys. Ah, uh, no. not flavored, no. <laughs> no. Any new expression? Uh, I think what he's, are we asking about is there going to be another XCF in the future? Is that maybe what the question was? No, he, I think he was asking about new, possible new mash bills. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, six isn't, Drew said six isn't enough. Yeah. Yeah, we, we actually are very traditional in what we do. We, we don't... We don't make uh, cherry bourbon or vanilla bourbon and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I we're, we're, never we're, like to end on a flavored whiskey note. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I, I honestly, I, I wanted people to get to know you tonight. I wanted people to, to learn about your background and, and you know, the skiing, the... Norway, the uh, fact that you're, you came up through the ranks and um, won your wife's heart and raised two beautiful kids and you have a great family. I want people to get to know you. Everyone knows your whiskey, yeah. but this was, tonight was an opportunity to get to know you and learn that passion that you have for bourbon, the passion you have for your family. Brett, You've had 
you've got an amazing father. And I would like to end the night with, on a toast. After this toast, you will be able to speak with Evan uh, shortly. Like, we'll be kind of mingling around. You'll, you'll see us out there. There's still bottles for sale and everything. But this night was all about you and, and your whiskey and your family. And please, just grab the, the glass. My God, none of you have anything left. <laughs> for God's sake. I, we got to start reminding people to save something for a toast here. Yeah, looks like they poured a pretty short shot. And, and Fred, I just want to say, too, thank you for being a vessel for helping us learn more about Dad. Um, you know, Dad and I recently have been having a lot of Lexington adventures. I will just say that we washed my uh, gas tank very closely. We did have a few Seinfeld moments together. But I have learned a lot about Dad over the last six weeks, and I'm just glad that people are able to have a night with him as well tonight. So thank you for your consideration and for facilitating all yeah, of this. We appreciate it very much, Fred. But this night's not about me. And we really appreciate all of you coming. It's a big honor to be here. Yeah, Skull. Skull. Yeah, Skull. Skull. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you again so much. One more round of applause. Yeah. I guess that.